It is Friday, April 19th. Let's talk PlayStation. Welcome back, everyone, to another medieval episode of LTPS. As always, let's begin with our PS Plus reminder. The April PS Plus Essential lineup is still live on PSN, so make sure you claim those games before they go away. Also, PS Plus Extra and Premium. The April lineup is now live on PSN as well, and that also means we now have some games that are going to be exiting the service in about a month's time. And we've got a bit of a mass exodus going on. 25 games will be leaving the PS Plus game catalog uh, around May 15th, which uh, really it's more of a mass exodus for, I guess, Final Fantasy, because it's a lot of Final Fantasy games that are going to be expiring, which uh, the bad news there is that even with this uh, notice of about 30 days, you're not really going to have time to go through all those. <laughs> you're going to have to pick maybe one or two of them uh, to get through if you do want to play any of those titles. Uh, but at the very least, there are still a number of games in there that are more, I would say, weekend style games. You can get them done in about a day, uh, two days. So uh, at least for my personal recommendations, uh, you've got Abzu, Last Stop I did for 30 Platinums Part 2. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Also, um, Minute was great as well. That one I did for Part 3. Uh, also, uh, my friend Pedro, uh, I've heard a lot of great things about that game. Also, this is the Police 1 and 2. So, you know, some shorter games that are probably worth checking out. But as far as Final Fantasy goes, you might want to play at least one or two of those if you can make up that time. But yeah, it's uh, interesting because at least for, you know, games that tend to leave PS Plus, uh, the game catalog since the revamp in mid-2022, we've seen Sony actually maintain the library. As in, at the very least, the games that are leaving, they add the same amount of titles in, but more often there's always a net positive of titles that they're adding to where the library has been slowly growing to. I don't know what the final count is. I mean, I, it's been a while, but it was in the hundreds, if not a little over a thousand now at this point, because they've been maintaining that library library. But uh, yeah, this is the first example, I think, where they've actually not been able to do that, which not a huge deal in the grand scheme of things, but thought that was at least uh, worth mentioning. So yeah, about 30 days left to play all those games. Now, getting into our first news story, this one is more of a PSA, but for those that have not checked in on PlayStation Stars lately, uh, then you might want to do that if you have some points accumulating where you can actually redeem more full games, because recently Sony added uh, Helldivers 2 and also Rise of the Ronin on there, which uh, is noteworthy. They're recent releases, pretty high-profile releases, uh, so if you do have some points accumulated, then you might want to see if you can actually redeem these games uh, completely. For Rise of the Ronin, I know it's 17,500, and then Helldivers 2 is 10,000. Uh, Bellatro has been on there for a little bit now too. A few weeks it's been on there. Uh, that one's 3750, which, uh, you know, that game has really been blowing up lately. A lot of people seem to really enjoy that one. So always worth uh, at least pointing that out. So, uh, and especially because, you know, for some it's like, why would you redeem the games? Because the point value always comes out to the same amount from just standard USD or your, your local currency. So you're not saving money, but it does depend on the game. So if it's a, a recent release, and it's not going to go on sale anytime soon, then actually it is probably more advantageous to redeem it uh, directly because then you're avoiding uh, your local sales tax, right? So uh, in that case, I mean, if you want the game, then redeem the full game. Otherwise, then yeah, always take the, the basic PSN credit and then spend that wherever you want. But I thought that was also worth uh, putting out there as well. Next up, we have some new details for Ghost of Tsushima PC, which is still coming out on May 16th. Uh, but over on the PS blog, Nexus Software has outlined some new details about the game, that being the system requirements, where they're, as always, trying to accommodate very low-end PCs, but also high-end as well. Uh, they mentioned they're trying to fully optimize the game for ultra-wide monitors, even supporting up to 48 by 9 displays or triple monitor setups. Uh, they also confirmed that crossplay is going to be available, so PC players can log in with a PSN ID and you can still play Legends mode with PS4 and PS5 players, which is pretty cool. But uh, the real big news here is that this is the first PlayStation Studios game on PC to offer a in-game PlayStation overlay menu. So you can access this in-game or use the uh, keyboard shortcut Shift and F1 to open it. And this is where you can sign into PSN, see your friends list, trophies, profile, and uh, mess around with some settings, that being uh, account management and things like that. Uh, but we are learning that, yes, PSN trophies are properly supported for Ghost of Tsushima, it's going to be a shared list between PS5 and PC, so it's not a separate list, which for many is probably bad news, but uh, we do know that it will be something where you can earn trophies on the PC version, and also you can still earn achievements through Steam and uh, the Epic Game Store as well. So if you care about those, then you can do those simultaneously. Uh, and the real crux of the issue here is that there's no cross-save announced, as far as we know right now. So because it's a shared list, that means that 
you know, if you've made uh, made any progress on the PS5 version, which is also notable here because we, we've basically got these sort of, like there's a now a fine line between this era of PlayStation where, you know, previously PS3, 4, Vita, you know, developers could if they want to share a list on those platforms as well. But we've seen throughout the entire PS5 cycle that developers cannot do this for PS4 to 5. PS5, every single native PS5 game has to have a separate trophy list. But now we know it's PS5 and PC that can share a list, right? So having said that, it's something where, you know, with a shared list, that's great. But if there's no cross save, then as a console player, there's really very little advantage here because, uh, you know, at that point, you're, you're starting the game from scratch. You can still sign into PSN and whatever progress you made on PS5, it will be there. But if you can't transfer over a save file, then you, you've gotta, you're you got going to have to start the game completely and therefore work up to the progress that you made on the PS5 version and then play it from there. I imagine Legend trophies might be a little bit different because if you're signing into PSN then you can just immediately you know server side all that stored so you can probably keep that progress going but single player wise there's really no advantage here but um, it is something where you can do it now so uh, that and also having this in-game in menu be available it's a big step for uh, PlayStation Studios and their PC support I think we all saw this coming eventually uh if anything i'm just surprised that it's more of a title by title basis thing because you know conceivably this will be something uh nexus software and other uh, in-house ps studio games will uh, will developers will want to do for the their future pc releases like this is the the new expected norm i would imagine and perhaps uh, perhaps we'll see patches for prior ps studio games as well for this again in-game overlay menu it's not a separate client that you use to log in and launch games and things like that sony will probably still want to do that at some point i imagine i think that's also probably still in the works uh, but for now baby steps we have this which is cool but uh yeah a shared list meaning you can't you know earn a, a new separate platinum you can't carry over progress for single player games so not the best news but uh i think we'll eventually get there and maybe they will at some point support cross save which would be ideal now this story is something where I did not think this was going to happen, certainly not eight years later, but it actually did, which is the 2016 Ratchet and Clank remake on PS4, where uh, it actually got some new-ish content. And what I mean is, uh, if you remember years ago before the game came out, if you did pre-order it, then you got access to the, the bouncer weapon, which you know was cool, but it's something where it was never made available for, for everyone. Because sometimes studios will do that a year, two years after, sometimes they'll unlock the, the pre-order content for everyone, doesn't happen all the time but usually that's nice when it does happen and so in this case that finally happened eight years later for this bouncer uh, pre-order item so uh, that's according to insomniac's community and marketing director james stevenson where he's been pushing for this to happen for like five years uh, but it was advanced senior community manager aaron espinoza that was finally able to pull it off so uh, thank you aaron very cool after <laughs> eight years of this game uh, being available uh, i mean the most recent update for it was not that long ago because it was unlocked for the frame rate when played on PS5 through backwards compatibility, which was awesome. Uh, but this one little thing that I think, you know, for many would consider uh, something that would be nice to have, but oh, if it didn't happen after eight years, then it's not going to happen ever. Uh, cool that it actually did. So uh, shout out to Insomniac for, again, being just excellent at, you know, little sort of uh, community goodwill gestures like that. Next up, we have some more PlayStation 5 Pro news. Uh, Kinda, because again, this was something where if you saw the Tuesday upload where we did kind of a recap of every single uh, PS5 Pro rumor so far, that being the basic spec sheet and what Sony wants from studios and uh, PS5 Pro enhancement labels and things like that. So we kind of covered a good portion of everything we've known so far uh, because The Verge had put out a report about them more or less getting all the info that's already been shared around from Insider Gaming and uh, Moore's Law is dead. Well, the following day, they did a separate new report, uh, this one going over, I guess, more details for the PS5 Pro enhanced labels and uh, what studios have to do to get that label, which again, this kind of goes back to Insider Gaming where they already outlined exactly what it has to be and it could be a number of things uh, either increasing target resolution increasing the frame rate target or enabling ray tracing effects um, and apparently sony wants uh, or sony sony would ideally want a separate performance mode that's specifically for ps5 pro and they also mentioned that ps5 pro uh, will have what uh, the verge calls quote an ultra boost mode
mode, uh, which is basically what PS4 Pro had if a game has any sort of variable elements, especially VRR enabled games, then PS5 Pro should be able to improve them. So that being uh, frame rate or of course uh, variable resolutions where if it's, you know, again, dynamic, it can, you know, PS5 Pro should in theory be able to hold the higher end of that, that frame rate target for, or excuse me, uh, resolution target for that particular game. Uh, without any patches, mind you. So exactly how PS4 Pro did this. So even before the PS5 Pro rumors uh, really kicked off, I mean, that was always something where we were kind of expecting PS5 Pro would do that for unpatched games. Uh, so I again, I, I'm not sure why they really ran with that report because I believe they initially did report on the news from Insider Gaming as well. So they're more or less doing it again, uh, but just them now having access to the documents, which I, I guess is fine if they're wanting to uh, do that for corroborating everything we've known so far. But uh, if you saw that report, there's really no new information in there so for right now ps5 pro everything that you've heard so far is still basically the most up-to-date info Next up, let's talk about developer Clap Hands, uh, which used to be a very well-known PlayStation uh, second-party partner because they have been historically working on the Hot Shots franchise for a very long time, up until you know a few years ago where Sony doesn't contract them out anymore for working on the Hot Shots IP. Now they moved on to mobile and they also shipped a Switch game, which is still golfing basically because that's what the studio is primarily known for they just can't make the hot shots ip anymore because sony owns that so they moved on to make golf games on other platforms not even shipping on playstation mind you which uh i guess is somewhat noteworthy uh and so we have news here that they're doing a new vr game called ultimate swing golf and that's going to release on metaquest 2 3 and the pro uh releasing on may 16th and there is no news for a playstation vr 2 version which you would hope ideally they will eventually eventually do that, but uh, I, I feel like this is just one of those examples where, uh, and it, maybe it speaks more on PSVR 2 broadly, which is always su such an exhausting topic because people tend to, I, I think, really sort of grab at this low-hanging fruit about how PSVR 2 is doing when generally, like, it's got a lot of software support, a lot of dev ship on it, but there is always the, the case where sometimes, and this is understandable, but developers will prioritize MetaQuest since there are many more headsets out there uh, for that versus PSVR SBR2. So it makes sense on paper, but uh, at least with this one, it really does sting to have, you know, this um, long-standing PlayStation partner that can no longer work on the Hot Shots IP, but there's not even this sort of encouragement from the Sony side of things about, hey, let's get this, you know, game over that you're now doing that, you know, you own the IP, but let's get this moved over and ported onto uh, PlayStation platforms. And so, I don't know, it's one of those things where it's disappointing, but, uh, you know, that's just how these things go. Moving on to Final Fantasy 16, uh, the Rising Tide DLC just came out, so uh, if you're playing it right now or you're planning to over the weekend, then as I always say, have a good time, hope you enjoy it. Uh, I have no idea when I'll be able to jump into it, but uh, what we can say is that patch 1.31 is also available for all players with or without the DLC, uh, and this is the patch that had a number of quality of life improvements, like being able to uh, jump right back to the quest giver after you complete a quest, I should say, uh, or also customizing the controller layout. But there's actually a number of things in those patch notes that were really surprising. They're making buffs across the board, so a lot of the iconic abilities either had their damage increased uh, or the recast time reduced a number of accessories saw a boost as well and uh more importantly the well probably the biggest patch note item in here the cooldown time on being able to pet torgal has been reduced as well so that is uh fantastic news excellent that we can pet Torgal more often but uh i guess it's just it's noteworthy that they're still improving the game a lot because you know day one even though they had to ship a day one patch and they said they tried to uh, avoid doing that the game was very complete as in it was a very good solid package uh without the day one patch but uh yeah they're still capitalizing on it and you have to figure that's all going to be available for pc when they eventually ship that version as well so uh, great to see that in other Final Fantasy 16 news, we can also mention this new interview on Push Square speaking with the DLC director, uh, Takio Kujiraoka, where they mentioned how, based on player feedback, they wanted to give the DLC a higher baseline difficulty, which I would agree, considering the base game does get a little bit too easy on all settings uh, once you're in the, the, the later half and you have more iconic abilities. Uh, but they also mentioned how they were able to acquire new and younger audiences with this game. So uh, Takio says, and I quote here, in recent years, players of the Final Fantasy series have tended to skew towards a higher age range. 
However, this time there are survey results showing that more people in their teens and 20s played Final Fantasy 16. I think this shows that, to a certain extent, we've achieved one of our initial goals, to have players of all ages play the latest Final Fantasy game. This doesn't mean that all future Final Fantasy games will take on a similar direction to Final Fantasy 16, but I do think it means that we've been able to bring new players on board and open new possibilities for the development team that will work on future installments in the series. So what's interesting about that is that it's good news, right? Because this franchise, uh, in a way, has aged with the community, uh, and they do have to be concerned with bringing in new players, right? There has to be some turnover here, and uh, not have your primary age group be something where it's going to they're, they're going to expire, not to be morbid. Uh, but with this game, it's rated M. So it's <laughs> technically with this franchise, like this one kind of goes against the grain of having a higher age uh, rating, but uh, it did bring in new players, which is good to see. And perhaps that's why this game did perform, uh, we assume, better than what has been going on with Rebirth, which is this notion that the game is underperforming. And so that goes into our next news story about how Rebirth might be underperforming based on what a research analyst said on X, where this comes from Daniel Ahmad, the director of research and insights at Nico Partners. Uh, so as part of a thread on X, they were talking about Rebirth sales, how they are indeed underperforming. When somebody responded asking for a clarification, Daniel said that it's doing about half of what Remake did in the same time frame with a possible week or tail before a PS Plus release. So that was picked up by a few sites, uh, showed up on some forums because, you know, this game and same with 16, there's been a lot of discussion on if the sales are good for Square or not good, which, uh, I mean, the one thing to always remember is that we're talking about Square where they tend to have these unrealistic expectations of how well their games should be doing. A game will sell millions of units and they still say, ah, it didn't really do all that well. I don't, so it's always like from Square's point of view, that's why I just, I'm so... I'm really looking forward to what they say about this game for their next financial report and what they say to shareholders. I'm sure if it's not doing that well, they'll try and phrase it in a way that, um, I guess, lightens the, the mood or something. But, you know, either way, uh, what I will say about this is I'm still incredibly confused as to why we are comparing it to Remake. Even for somebody like Daniel, like, what what are we doing here? We know we can't compare these games. There are one's mid-life cycle PS5, one's late life cycle PS4 with a 100 million plus install base. The novelty of it being the first entry in a remake of a, a nostalgic game. Uh, also, the COVID lockdowns, which that immediately puts it into this sort of... Um, separate category that's really kind of an anomaly. Like there's just no universe where the game is going to even sell, I would argue, three quarters of what Remake was going to do, uh, given this current circumstance. Now, if it, the game is underperforming, that actually would not surprise me, given that we've had some indicators that it's doing either a little bit less than 16 or maybe about the same as 16, which is much, I guess, I probably a more fair benchmark than Remake, obviously, but um, it's just something where I feel like we're talking in circles and nothing useful is really being said at this point. Like, we just have to wait and see what Square says because we can't compare it to Remake. Uh, comparing it to 16 is better, but um, I'll say this. The one thing that does typically make sense is that, like, right when a game comes out, whether it's, you know, a game that's coming out at the start of the life cycle or near the end, you, you can draw some comparables just based on the initial wave of, you know, like day one sales, because typically you're going to have very dedicated customers that are, you know, willing to buy day one for like a console, right? They're going to buy in early as an adopter. Um, and that would be the same buyer all the way through that console cycle. So there is uh, some comparables that can be drawn regardless of, of, uh, of install base, I should say, excuse me. But um, in this case, I just, Remake is obviously in this sort of completely different uh, area given the novelty of it being a remake for a very nostalgic game late life cycle right before the lockdowns there's just there's there's simply no point in comparing them Moving on to Final Fantasy VII Remake Part 3, where we just got some early indicators as to when the game might be coming out, uh, which might be sooner than you think. So this was based on a translation done by Audrey over on X for Final Fantasy VII Rebirth's Ultimania, and we found out that Part 3's main story has basically already been completed, uh, and that the team is looking to start voice recording very soon. Uh, Yoshinori Katase also explained that they were able to get Rebirth out in such a timely manner due to retaining most of the staff from Remake, and that's going to be the case going into Part 3 as well. 
Uh, we also found out that Rebirth was completed in three years, where they primarily began work after releasing the Integrate content, which took about a year itself, so they hope to stick to that same schedule again for Part 3. So that should mean Part 3 will release sometime around 2027, maybe early 2028. So that does give us a, a baseline of when to expect the final entry in this uh, in the series, which uh, that would actually place it pretty much right around PlayStation 6. We do know that is around the time that, uh, well, at that point, we'll certainly have rumors and speculation, perhaps a formal announcement by then. Uh, but it's something where that will probably be a, a cross-gen game. It'll probably initially release on PS5, uh, but you will get a native PlayStation 6 version, which is... Uh, crazy to think about but uh you know that's a very fast turnaround time when you think about how long it takes some studios to get games out nowadays but uh it is something where since it's primarily the same universe a lot of the same assets and as they say they've got the same team uh going over project to project so um that's actually pretty good they've been able to really optimize this game uh, or this entire series in a way that is conducive to finishing it in what nowadays at least by today's standards does seem like a, a timely manner so only a few years and we might be seeing uh, what part three ends up looking like now going back to uh, games that might be underperforming, we can also say that we have some indicators that that might be happening for Rise of the Ronin, the recently released uh, Koei Tecmo PS5 exclusive as well. Uh, so Koei Tecmo recently sent out a note to investors about revising their forecast for their financial year ending uh, March 31st, 2025, uh, where the net sales forecast was revised down by 11.6% and operating income down 28%, which this was primarily due to recent game releases performing worse than, than expected. Uh, and while Rise of the Ronin is not named, it's surely one of the few, few other titles that you know did contribute to this. Uh, so we don't really know how well this game is doing either. The initial sort of sales charting for this game was fine, but of course it was right next to uh, Dragon's Dogma 2, which you know at the time, right when the reviews came out, it's like, well, that game is probably taking a lot of wind out of the sales for uh, Rise of the Ronin, so that was probably not the best play to ship the game right next to Dragon's Dogma. So we'll see uh, how this one does over time. This one is considered a proper PlayStation Studios title, despite it being uh, from a third party and there's no sort of ownership of the IP from Sony's end. So this game uh, does, in a way, have some a certain level of importance, but uh, yeah, we'll have to wait and see where this game does fall. Next up, we have more of a thought-provoking conversation topic that popped up yesterday from Derek Strickland writing for Tweaktown, where uh, they put up this article where it's not really news, but it is something where the title simply reads, Microsoft has more bestsellers on the PlayStation Store than Sony does. Because that is true. When you acquire two big third-party publishers, that being Activision, Blizzard, and Bethesda, that is going to happen. So we have Call of Duty that's always going to be charting high on the PS Store, uh, but also the recent release of the Amazon Fallout series, which has garnered a lot of interest for the games, and also the native PS5 version for Fallout 4 coming out. So a lot of people playing that, Fallout 76. Uh, they're also finally shipping uh, Grounded and uh, Sea of Thieves. So Sea of Thieves has been on there for a while. And so yes, by sheer virtue of how many studios uh, Microsoft has them being primarily third party initially. So it's not like, as we often say, like Microsoft didn't make those games. They're just now the new parent company. Uh, but by that sheer virtue, they are going to have more bestsellers on the PlayStation store. So it's been more of a conversation starter. And it really is fascinating to think about where we are now versus, you know, even four years ago at the start of this very generation where we, you know, were fully expecting for PS5 and Series S and X that, you know, Microsoft was going to be uh, following the traditional console uh, roadmap, which is, you know, exclusivity and uh, funding IP and, and building IP and uh, securing third-party exclusives as every manufacturer does do, right? They all do it, Sony, Nintendo, and Microsoft. Uh, and they initially did do that, but things changed after the two massive acquisitions of the regulatory heat and also seeing that Series X uh, and S platforms have not been selling very well. So, I mean, it's one of those stories where I think it does, of course, as these things always tend to do, they lean into a lot of fanboy arguing, but uh, the actual sort of grounded reality here is that, you know, in a way, this is Microsoft's path for just making a boatload of money because, again, the, the 
well, the parent ownership uh, or outside of the, the Xbox team, you know, the CEO, Satya Nadella, or the um, uh, the CFO, what the shareholders want. They just simply want returns out of all these IP that they've acquired and all these studios that they own. And so in a way, uh, PlayStation has now been seen as less of a competitor and is more of a, you know, a platform that gets them to those goals. And that's still, it's more about the brand pivot that Xbox uh, is going through. And we're, you know, living in the, uh, we're living it right now, seeing this, uh, this transition happen. Now getting into some initially alarming news about physical media, that being Target stores. Here in the US we have a retail giant called Target uh, and they sell a lot of video games and also movies, TV shows, things like that. And so over on X, the account uh, president of physical media, they claimed that Target stores will stop selling physical media in store and also online by 2025. But a Target spokesperson has given IGN a statement and they've confirmed that they will be limiting their selection of DVDs based on consumer habits and recent release but they will still offer thousands of them online and also in store there will be no changes to physical video games so that's good news uh, but it's just it's a little frustrating that sometimes we can have what might initially be uh, a random account out of nowhere or at least to some people that didn't know about them before uh, it appears random it's this big alarming news that um, to a degree had something there because Target does have this new policy that they've confirmed to IGN but it's not even close to what was being said so one report initially was about how they're just completely dropping physical media in store and online, which would be very bad uh, to it being, oh, we're just lessening the DVD shelf presence, but there, there's still going to be thousands of DVDs online and also nothing is changing for video, uh, changing for video games. So quite the difference there. It's always worth, <laughs> you know, really chasing these things down or waiting for the company to respond and give a give an actual uh statement on the affairs so if you saw this news it's not nearly as bad but we have seen a string of uh well, bad news surrounding retail really lessening their presence with physical media but games so far have been holding strong at least here in the u.s uh, not the case everywhere but uh games are still the one physical medium that does move a fair amount versus you know dvd blu-ray things like that so for now uh crisis averted kind of but we all assume that eventually, at some point, we will have some uh, bad news about this. With, I guess, again, physical in-store presence. I still find that there will always be a place for it uh, online, but that still primarily depends on console manufacturers offering a way to play physical media. Nintendo and Sony, I think, are mostly safe for at least another generation. Uh, Microsoft, however, no, I don't think so. Now, with all that said, it is time for Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway, where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email rex. And this week, we have another game giveaway, which is for another Crab's Treasure coming out next week on PS5, April 25th. It's a really a Souls-like underwater 3D platformer game. It looks amazing. I was genuinely excited for this. And now we have five codes to give away, courtesy of Agro Crab Games, which is awesome. So if you'd like to win, then follow the link down below and uh, enter the Gleam giveaway, and we'll announce the winners next week because we are trying to give away some crabs of the fighting variety. Those are some of the stories from this past week that I wanted to talk about with you all. And our Tuesday video was looking at all the PS5 Pro rumors so far. So really more of a recap on the specs, PSSR, how developers can utilize the system, PS5 Pro enhancements, things like that. And so uh, if you want to get caught up in about 10 minutes on what PS5 Pro is all about, then there you go. And that is pretty much it. So that concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Panecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me, and I will see you all next Friday.